Welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report, our region's longest running public affairs program. Lawmakers from Northeastern Minnesota are joining us today for a recap of the week's activities at the state capitol. This is your opportunity to call or email your legislative questions and have them answered live on the air. Minnesota Legislative Report starts now. Hello and welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report. I'm your host, Tony Sertich. Lawmakers spent much of the past week in their respective bodies debating and voting on budget bills late into the night. With three weeks to go, the end is in sight, but there's much left to be done. Today shows an opportunity for viewers to ask questions to the lawmakers who represent you. Please call the number on your screen or email questions to ask at wdse.org. We have a great lineup to answer those questions tonight. Joining me in studio is Representative Nathan Nelson, a Republican from Hinckley, representing House District 11B. Welcome, Representative Nelson. And joining us virtually today is Representative Liz Olson, a DFLer from Duluth, representing House District 7B, and she's the Deputy Majority Leader. Welcome, Representative Olson. All right, well, great to have you both here. First question is, uh, WDSE has been doing a show called Lessons from COVID-19. And we'll start with you, Representative Nelson. Uh, can you give us maybe a positive and a negative of being a legislator serving in the time of COVID-19? A uh, positive and negative, just one of each? Yeah. Or is there more than that we can have? Uh, you know, it's, um, I think probably a, a positive and a negative, both and all in one, is a broadband. Uh, you know, we've, we've learned that uh, there's areas that uh, where we thought we had good broadband, we definitely need more of, uh, definitely needs better service. And, uh, and I think one of the other things, you know, along with that is that we see that uh, with that, we've, we've relied on each other a lot more than what we maybe typically would have. And so we've, um, it's kind of the old uh, pulling together as a community. And a lot of ways we've done that, uh, you know, rural areas have, have worked together well, and it's been good to see that happening. And, and um, you know, we've learned a lot about technology, but I think along, we also have learned that it's important to get together. And uh, this last week, as we've been getting to, uh, I think there's been a few more people that have been at the Capitol on the floor. The, on the April 15th, we were able to have uh, up the number up to 20, uh, from I think 25 up to 55 members on the floor. And so there's, there's been more people there. Uh, just the CDC had re reduced the, or relaxed the uh, regulations, restrictions. And it's been, it's been really good to have that because I think getting together has been one thing that we have all been really missing and it's been important. Great. Representative Olson, a positive and a negative serving in the time of COVID-19. I think that starting with the negative, I mean, it's really hard to pass a state budget in a divided government, even when we're in person. So there's the challenges of just legislating remotely. And I think also just doubling with the type of year we've had, it's been a hard year for a lot of Minnesotans in a number of ways and so a lot of constituents have been reaching out to us you know with these enormous problems that existed before COVID that have just been made worse and really looking for legislative solutions so our work was was really cut out for us with the state budget anyway and now with the pandemic and what it's really done uh, to to really um, show some of the inequalities that we've known for a long time and so it's just complicated our work but I think it's presented us with a big opportunity to really invest in a, with the way that we recover and we come out of the pandemic. And I think one of the most positive things that's come out of remote legislating is the ability for greater Minnesota to participate. We've, I've heard loud and clear from a number of people how much easier it was that you didn't have to drive 150 miles for a three minute testimony in committee in a snowstorm that you could do it via Zoom. And so I think there are some things that I really hope we continue to do even when we go back to quote unquote normal. So there's both opportunities and challenges, but I'm, I think we're all looking forward though to putting this year in the rear view mirror. Great, well, just as a reminder, I want folks to email or call in any questions you have of our two legislators. I wanna talk about some of those big issues. Uh, the first one, childcare. We're hearing this from uh, all across Minnesota, especially in greater Minnesota. Representative Olson, uh, you've become known as one of the leaders on the child care issue. Can you update us on the status of child care legislation? 
Yeah, I think that's a great question and something we, I think both, you know, Representative Nelson and I in Greater Minnesota, it's it's been a challenge everywhere, but in particular in Greater Minnesota. And the pandemic only showed that even more in more stark contrast. And so we talk about childcare in a variety of ways. We talk about both access to ch quality childcare and we talk about affordability. And so we really need to tackle both. And in the House budget, we really took that very seriously. So we had our early childhood committee that really looked at raising CCAP rates, which is essentially making it more affordable for low income people to access childcare. We've built in spots in our workforce development, seeing it as a workforce issue, particularly in greater Minnesota, that we need to increase the number of slots available. And we need to do that through capital improvement capital projects, we need to do that in a variety of ways. So we also have it in our capital investment budget as well. So we saw it in a whole host of different places that it's really played out to really try to do something big around tackling. Great. Okay, so uh, looks like we had some technical difficulty with Representative Olson. Representative Nelson, any uh, discussion on child care? Yeah, and I, I think uh, you know, Representative Olson, you know, touched on a lot of great things there that uh, you know, we definitely have seen an importance on, you know, funding that. And, you know, one thing that I'm hearing from our, you know, in our schools and our, you know, locally is, uh, you know, they're looking at going to child care um, because they're, they're noticing some of the ch uh, students that haven't, whether that's been at home or in a daycare setting, they're, they're noticing the, the achievement gap that's coming in. And, uh, you know, they're getting into, you know, the benchmarks that they're wanting to see you know, before kindergarten or at the end of kindergarten. And, you know, for those that haven't, you know, haven't had the individual attention on the children, you know, there's, there's children falling behind. And so that's something that they're really quite concerned about. And, and so it is a big issue. And just the, just the, uh, the lack of it in greater Minnesota, it's, um, it's been a challenging year. And, uh, you know, many people have done the best they can in that, you know, providing daycare and child care, but at the same time, it has it has really been uh, you know stretched to the max. And then it's also different because there's some that are working from home, and there so there's there's some child care that has freed up, but then others have needed child care because uh, maybe they're you know they had child care at work, and now now they're re working remotely, and it's just um, their schedules aren't working. For allowing a child care, so it's it's been a been a very different year that way. Sure. And for viewers at home, uh, we have some technical difficulties with Representative Olson, and we're working to see if we can get her back on the air. But Representative Nelson, you and I can talk a bit more right now. You are a farmer. Uh, one of the bills that generally gets broad bipartisan support is the Ag Finance Bill, the Budget Bill for Agriculture. Uh, voted off the floor uh, just recently in the past week or so. Can you talk a bit about what's in that bill, what you what you like that's in that bill, and any questions or concerns you have of that bill moving forward? Uh, one of the, yeah, there's, there's a lot of good things in that bill. Uh, there's some, some funding for uh, beginning and uh, disadvantaged farmers. And, you know, I think that's one of the th areas that in this pandemic, uh, you know, the thinking of a year ago if you went to the grocery store you were you may be looking for paper products so uh, napkins toilet paper sanitizer but you also might be looking in the produce and meat aisle and um, you know just with the panic of it there were sometimes it was sold out and and so what we've seen with that there was people that were really interested in knowing where they're wanting to make sure they can pr procure it um, be able to ha you know feed their families so that's been something that's been important to uh, um, so there's some uh, funding for processing, helping uh, you know get smaller processors started up because that was one of the things that we saw was once the uh, uh, larger processing plants, uh, when they when they had COVID cases hit, I mean they closed down, and so you know it, it led to the unfortunate um, in the swine industry, especially there were there were farms that had to euthanize their swine because they've got. They got beyond the, the market weight and, you know, it was just a un terribly unfortunate situation. But at the same time that, you know, down the, down the road that came the shortage in the shelves. And, and so there's been just the, this, the desire to make sure that people are able to, you know, have that. So there's been that connection. There's kind of been that little bit more of a understanding of where their food is coming from and, and be able to, to source that. So, um, there's been a lot of people that have gotten in, 
interested in agriculture. And so there's some funding for that and also as you know, rural broadband um, and not just rural, I mean, there's, there's people probably right here in Duluth that may not have as, as good of broadband as, or internet access as they, they could or should or have needed over this past year. And uh, so that's, that's another area of, of funding as well. And, and I think for my area and uh, kind of a lot of the northeastern eastern Minnesota, one of the other areas that we're talking about and looking at is um, Minnesota has gotten the management back from the, uh, from the federal level of the gray wolf, of the timber wolf. And you know, for myself and other cattle producers, and, and not, even, not even that, um, you know, there, there's a big interest in, uh, you know, the, how the DNR is going to manage, but at the same time, there's the depredation payments for, for the loss to one of our livestock and stuff. So, and that, that funding is in there and well, and that's a piece that I think is important as well. Great. And just as a reminder, please uh, call in, email in your questions. We do have a question from a viewer, uh, Representative Nelson. What is the current status regarding legalization of cannabis in Minnesota? I don't know if it's been through any of the committees you sit on yet. Uh, do you know where that legislation sits right now? Um, the, that legislation is, uh, it's a bill, HF 600, and it's working its way through. Um, it has been heard in both the Agriculture Committee and in the uh, um, Environmental Finance Committee. I've heard it two times now. And uh, I also serve on Legacy, and I haven't heard it in there. I don't know if that's an area that it's going to go or not, but um, it's, it has been working its way through the, through the committees. And uh, I don't know what the status of in the Senate side is, but I do know in the House that it has, has been systematically working through the committees. And um, I believe, believe it may be in uh, Ways and Means, which is really kind of the final stop uh, for the most part before the House floor. So. And for a bill like cannabis, it would have to go through a number of committees, both agriculture, environment, but then also all the public safety committees as yep. well. Um, do, have you uh, developed a position or thought out your position on that bill yet? It's, it's a complicated position, you know, because I, and I don't really, I don't know if I support it today, but uh, it is something that I do think that in the long term, I think that the, it will be legalized in Minnesota. And I think, uh, it is important to look at what's happened in other states and make sure that you know we learn from their mistakes because not everybody did it right. You know, Washington, Colorado were amongst the first that did legalize it, and and it, there's been some problems there. And uh, you know, the authors of the bill have recognized that, and they're they're working on how to uh, prevent those issues happening in Minnesota. So um, it, it is being worked on. Great. Well, let's take a step back out again. The major responsibility for the legislature this year is to pass a two-year budget. It has to be agreed by, by the House and the Senate, signed by the governor. Approximately $52 billion is roughly the range that folks are talking about for two years. Where do you see the major stumbling bo blocks to get agreement? Minnesota is the only state in the nation that has a divided legislature of all 50 states. And so where do you see both the stumbling blocks to getting agreement on this budget, and where do you see there to be incentive or opportunity to find that success? I think, let's start with opportunity first. I think, uh, you know, Representative Olson, as she said before, you know, it's, we're all working on this, getting it done. You know, we, we all see the need for it. I think all of us would love to be done on May 17th and uh, be able to go home and, you know, tell our constituents, hey, we, the, we've gotten the job done. Let's, um, you know, now that the budget is done, let's, let's work on the, the issues that, that we need to be working on to really focusing on your needs. And, and I think, as we, you know, that's an opportunity I think all of us are looking at. Um, one, of the, one of the big stumbling blocks in, uh, in issues coming before us, uh, it's actually our technology that we have right, right now. Uh, you know, Liz Olson is you know, not in this uh, show anymore because of uh, you know, techni technological glitch. And so much of the legislature is meet meeting over Zoom. Uh, we can have 55 House members on the floor currently and then some staff. But uh, I, th I think one of the big challenges this past year has been when you're meeting remotely, it's so easy to, to stay in your camp with your caucus or your, 
your group of people here and the other group be over here and not being able to come together. Um, you know, this last week, there, you know, with more people on the House floor hearing the budget bills, it was so good to be, uh, I was down there on Tuesday or Wednesday and Thursday. And uh, when you step out, out of the chamber and you're visiting in the hallway or in the rotunda with other members and it's just, you know, they can be across the aisle, they can have a different viewpoint, but you can visit with them and those barriers come down of, well, I, I understand your viewpoint. And, you know, I, and that's unfortunately, you know, 55 out of 134 are there on the floor. So we're not there yet. And, I, and we're gonna get there, but uh, that's, that's a major stumbling block. And it's just not being able to be in the room. And, you know, some of the bills that are, you know, being passed out, um, I've gotten selected to be on the Agriculture uh, Conference Committee between the House and the Senate. And we don't know yet if we're gonna be meeting in person. And I, I, I really hope that we can be meeting in person. I mean, I think there's big enough rooms that, you know, what if, if we have to do a hybrid of, you know, those that can meet or feel comfortable meeting in person, um, if they can do that, I, I really hope so. But, you know, we haven't heard the guidance on that yet if we can do that. And, and I just, I think one of the best things that we need to do is get back together in person and, and really work to get this budget finished because that's what, that's what we're sent there to do. And, you know, in the first year of the biennium, that is our job. Great. And we were working to get Representative Olson back. I heard in my ear that we may have Representative Olson back. Representative Olson, can you hear me? I can hear you guys. Wonderful. Well, thank you for uh, fighting through the technical difficulties. We apologize for that. Uh, we've been talking a bit about the overall state budget. And uh, my question really is about where do you think the stumbling box will be to get the House, the Senate, and the governor to come to an agreement broadly on a two-year budget? Yeah, I think I heard, I caught a little bit, so it's good to be back and sorry about that. Uh, but this is the reality of uh, legislating too in our pandemic times. But I did catch a little bit what Representative Nelson said about the virtual element, obviously making it more complicated. And so I definitely think that is a challenge being we are the only divided legislature in the, in the country coming up with a state budget. We did it before and I know we can do it again, but obviously that makes it slightly more complicated. I would also say too that we are passing these big budget bills off the floor right now and there is a big distance to the cover between what the house has put forward which we're seeing it as an opportunity to invest in a number of the really important issues that we touched on child care before i got disconnected education uh, health care there's so many things that really housing instability that we saw during the pandemic that only got worse. And so the House budget really puts forward a way to address those. And so we have our, our budget bills, which really are making investments in childcare and our education system and making sure people can keep a roof over their head. And so we put forward our bills in a way that does that, where unfortunately the Senate is more in the cut mentality that this is a time to tighten our belts and to continue to do what we've done before. and. We know not all Minnesotans have experienced the pandemic in the same way, unlike any other time in history when we face something like this. There's actually usually income inequality lessons, and during this pandemic time, it's actually grown worse. And so there are Minnesotans that just aren't doing well. And so the House has really legislated with them in mind, and the Senate is really put forward put forward more of a status quo budget. And so we have a lot of work to do in the next couple of weeks to come together. And I hope that the Senate and the, the GOP can come along and see that we really need to take care of Minnesotans in this budget. A question from a viewer. We get this question each week, uh, and you'll know why when I ask it. Uh, our federal tax date for filing has been extended to May 17th, which is actually the last day of the legislative session as well. And this viewer is emailing in wondering about, will we get unemployment tax exemption similar to the federal forgiveness on the unemployment tax on the first $10,200? And at the same time, if you could answer that question around PPP, which is the program that uh, helped our small businesses as well. Representative Olson, uh, what is the likelihood of both that passing and is there the opportunity where it may pass actually before folks have to file on the 17th? Yeah, great question. I know that's top of mind. So we were just on the House floor, I believe it was Thursday. So just this week, we passed that in the House. 
and I was a yes vote on that our tax bill, which has both in there. So it's definitely something we put forward in our tax bill, and I know the Senate has as well. So it's it's alive and well, and will definitely be part of the conversation as we move towards the end of session. And it's something we've heard loud and clear from constituents. And again, it was in the House tax bill that passed off the floor this past week. And so. Yep, hopeful we're moving towards the end and in a rapid way that can get that done as well as everything else that we've talked about already on the show. Representative Nelson? Yeah, and it's, uh, as Representative Olson said, yes, it is in the House bill, and I believe the Senate has it in theirs. It's a little bit different language. There's a little bit, of, there's some differences in it, but, uh, you know, the, the unemployment insurance as well as the PPP, I believe that's going to be covered. And, and I really hope that is something that we can get that done before May 17th. Um, you know, if, if we could get those differences done and ironed out before taxes are due is, are great. But uh, one thing I'm telling my businesses and you know individuals that are calling me asking me, hey, is this gonna get done? What do I do? Um, you know, I, I've, I'm not a CPA, so but I have told them, you know, Visit, visit with their CPA, um, you know, if they need to, if they feel that it's best in their interest to take and, and to file their taxes and then later amend them, um, just, I, I believe it's going to happen. I, I think all parties want this, uh, the PPP exemption and the, the unemployment insurance to be, to be uh, treated the same as it is federally. And, and so it's, I mean, it really needs to be a discussion with your, with your accountant on, you know, do, we, do you wait till the tax bill or do you, do you file before that and then do an amendment? But I think it's something that we all, we all want to see happen and I think it needs to happen sooner than later. Great. Uh, this week we saw uh, the verdict uh, of guilty in the uh, trial of Derek Chauvin. I know there's been a lot of interest in uh, potentially some more policy reform around policing in Minnesota. I know a bill was passed last year, but there's definitely some energy and folks wanting to push that uh, and for more reform this year. Rep. Nelson, any thoughts on further police reform legislation and the likelihood of that happening in the next three weeks? Um, you know, and I believe, the, I believe the reform has passed off of the House floor. I'm not positive on that, but it is something that you know, I, I think that it needs to be all sides working together on this. That, you know, it needs to be something that, um, you know, the communities that are really advocating for it, that they need to be, their voices need to be heard. And I also believe that the law enforcement needs to be, that they need to be at the table and their voices heard as well. And, you know, as we come together on this and, and we hear the, you know, is this, is this coming to the, end of session and a, you know, a bill coming together, um, you know, we do need to listen to, the, to all sides and to, to really to be able to understand because I think you know, people are feeling that their voices aren't heard regardless of which side of the issue you're on. And I think it's easy, uh, you know, especially in rural Minnesota, to, to look and say, well, it's, you know, I like, I know my neighbor, he's, a, he's an officer, he's good. So, it's got to be the other ones that are bad. And so, um, and that's, I don't think that's really the case, but I, I think that it is an important issue. Great. Representative Olson, uh, police reform legislation. Yeah, this is a, I mean, with the, the verdict this week, I think everybody or, you know, the communities that were most impacted and were most anxious about this verdict and others are feeling that at least it was the first step towards accountability. And we heard the president and we heard others weigh in on that. And I, I would agree with that, but it doesn't change that we still need to do something about police reform and accountability in the legislature. We did some bipartisan work over the interim, but you know, as we've my BIPOC colleagues in the House and others that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of what we passed wouldn't even have prevented what happened to Dante Wright um, just this past last week as well. And so we have a long way to go. We have more we need to do. We did really great bipartisan work over the interim, but we need to do more. And so this week we put forward in, in our budget bill, our uh, public safety and judiciary budget bill, we put a number of provisions in that would do, try to essentially start to decriminalize poverty and therefore eliminate the number of contacts between law enforcement and communities of color that unfortunately 
end, don't end well, like what happened to Dante Wright and George Floyd. And so we have a number of those provisions that are in the House bill. And I was proud to be, you know, one of the votes that helped pass that legislation and to be strong with my DFL caucus that represents greater Minnesota, that represents urban communities and said, no, this is our time. We need to do something about this. And so that bill is, you know, passed off the House floor with just DFL votes. And unfortunately, our, our the Senate has said that they you know, aren't really interested in doing the taking action on these items. So we'll continue to make the voice heard. I know uh, a number of we have had letters from business community across the state, a number of unlikely allies in this work with our BIPOC community saying it's time. It's really time. We need to do something meaningful that would really start to stem the tide on what we've been seeing over the last few years. So I'm hopeful this will be a part of the conversation as we work towards that May 17th end and we do meaningful reform. Great, and I'd be remiss if we didn't uh, send our condolences for the passing of Vice President Walter Mondale at 93 years old. Many knew him as a federal elected official, but he got his start as the state attorney general. We only have about 20 seconds left. Representative Olson, any thoughts about the passing of Vice President Mondale? Yeah, I, th I mean, he was a giant. And I think that anybody that's in politics in Minnesota has had, he's had an impact on our state, our own personal, I think our trajectory in politics too has really been changed by the work he's done. And he's left quite a legacy. And we had a, a moment of silence for him on the House floor and a lot of meaningful stories about the way he's contributed to our state and made it better and really put forward a number of issues care about and are, you know, continue that legacy as we move forward as a state. Great. Representative Nelson, anything quickly to add? Yeah, I think one of the things that I've heard is that how he was just, you know, especially when the last uh, 10, 15 years, and just how he was just a person that really cared about Minnesota. And he, um, you know, it was people first, party second, and, you know, just a, a very classy person. Great, thank you. And unfortunately, we are out of time. And I would like to thank Representative Nathan Nelson and Representative Liz Olson for their time today. Join me again next Sunday, May 2nd, for another edition of Minnesota Legislative Report, when we will welcome more legislators from Northern Minnesota to the program. For the team at WDSC, I'm Tony Sertich. Have a great evening.